So some scientists wondered how much these CHEMA signals might play a role in emotional contagion among humans. In a 2012 study, one team of researchers designed an experiment to find out. In it, one set of participants watched videos that would provoke either fear or disgust, while wearing sweat pads in their armpits. Afterward, a second set of participants were asked to smell those sweat pads, and the experimenters recorded their emotional state. Conveniently, the emotions of fear and disgust tend to provoke opposite physical responses. When you're scared, your body will typically try to take in more sensory information. So your face will open up as you breathe more deeply and scan the environment with your eyes. On the other hand, when you're disgusted, you'll generally reject sensory information. Like, you'll walk past a row of porta pots and you'll scrunch up your face, take really shallow breaths, and look around less. Now, these reactions aren't always super visible to the eye, but by monitoring their eyes and facial movements, the researchers could tell which facial muscles were activated in each person, and which emotional state their expressions reflected. And the authors found that participants who sniffed a disgust sweat tended to display disgust, which, you know, seems like a normal reaction when you're sniffing sweat pads, but also, those who sniffed fear sweat would also display fear. In fact, a lot of what we perceive as flavor comes from odor molecules that float up to our smell receptors through our mouths. And as with taste, studies have shown the visual cues we get from color help us identify smells more quickly and accurately. In fact, one 1981 study found that the source of a smell doesn't have to be the corresponding color. The color and odor just sort of need to be in the same place. Like, the author of this study found that if an odor was presented along with colored words or patches, subjects could identify it faster and more accurately than odors presented with inappropriate color cues. So as an example, the smell of lemon would likely be easier to identify in a yellow room than in a pink room. Which sounds strange. But what all this research adds up to is very clear evidence that color influences our perception of smell and taste. What's less clear is why this happens. Scientists have not nailed down one single answer, but there are a few possibilities. The first is that the appearance of food or drinks produces what some researchers call an expectancy-based effect. Basically, the color of something tells you what to expect, and your expectation is actually enough to overpower reality and influence the way you identify a taste or smell. This idea is similar to the placebo effect, where people's beliefs about a treatment actually change the symptoms they experience. Another way color could influence how we identify a flavor or smell is by directing our attention. A very famous study done by colleagues at Duke University flashed either the Apple logo or the IBM logo to two randomized groups of participants. 
The study found that after being subliminally exposed to the Apple logo, compared to when you'd been exposed to IBM logo, participants performed better on creative tasks. And the argument is that Apple has been telling you this story over and over again, that Apple is the brand for hip, cool, fun, creative people. This is the true power of brands. They can influence our behavior in ways that extend way beyond the point of sale. So to what degree can the influence of brands wreak havoc on our ability to make rational spending decisions? This is Americus Reed. He studies identity and marketing at the University of Pennsylvania. When I make choices about different brands, I'm choosing to create an identity. When I put that shirt on, when I put those shoes on, those jeans, that hat, someone is going to form an impression about what I'm about. So if I'm choosing Nike over Under Armour, I'm choosing a kind of different way to express affiliation with sport. The Nike thing is about performance. The Under Armour thing is about the underdog. I have to choose which of these different conceptual pathways is most consistent with where I am in my life. And once a consumer makes that choice, their relationship with a brand can deepen to the point where they identify with that brand like family. And once you identify with a brand, it can shape the way you behave. One of the things I do in my psychology seminar is I assign papers to students and then I extract out propositions from the papers and their propositions that are debatable. Well, what you want to do as an educator is you don't want to put forward a specific point of view. Not when what you're trying to do is to discuss a contentious issue. What you want to do is teach people how to take an argument apart and formulate a response. And to do that it's actually extraordinarily useful to arbitrarily assign positions to people. It's like, I don't care what you think, you're pro on this topic, generate an argument. And what that does is it vastly widens people's conceptualizations of the argumentative space, because most really contentious issues, gun control, abortion, those sorts of things, there is a lot to be said on both sides. They wouldn't be contentious issues otherwise. They're issues that don't go away. Well, why? Well, because they're so complex. They don't lend themselves to easy unitary solutions. One of the things you want to learn if you're educated is that on any complex subject there's a lot to be said, and that you're going to come at that with your particular ideological bias. Let's say, your temperamental bias. Maybe even you might even come at it with things you've actually thought about, although that's pretty damn rare. But you need to learn just exactly how localized your viewpoint is.
So the three things that I think it really takes to be an effective manager were these. First of all, learn to delegate, you know. The most important thing is you have to trust your people to do work themselves, and if you're in the business of overseeing every single decision they make you're not going to be a very effective manager because you'll be stretched too thin and you'll certainly never be able to rise to higher levels of management where you're overseeing dozens or hundreds or even thousands of people. So that's the first thing. The second is work hard to understand what the people underneath you do. They have this, there's this tendency to think you know. If I came up through one skill as I oversee people with different skills, I'm just going to trust them to get it right and you have to. Of course you're not going to be able to understand what everybody on your team does all day, but if you can understand their motivations, their terminology, their way of communicating, you're going to be a lot better as a manager. And finally, this is a kind of simple thing, but have as many one-on-one -on -one meetings as you possibly can. I think one thing that there's a lot of evidence is that having one-on-one -on -one meetings, especially with your direct reports, is one of the strongest predictors of success as a manager. Big meetings aren't good. Little meetings can be very good. It's time-consuming, it's hard, but it's a thing that really correlates with success as a manager. Now, what's really interesting about this time is that because of coronavirus kids have all this time to self-reflect and self-assess. And so we should be actively promoting meta-learning during this time. And so what I've suggested is that we promote the idea of a learning journal. So the idea is this. Let kids decide their own learning path. Let them decide what they want to learn. It could be if they want to learn how to cook. It could be they want to learn how to drive a car. It doesn't matter. What's important is that they write down their learning journey. And so there are three components to a learning journal. First is to define the goal concretely and precisely. It's better to say I want to be able to run a marathon in less than four hours than it is to say I want to finish first in a marathon. Second is to write down the learning process. So think of a cooking recipe and writing down how you cook something. The third and most important component of a learning journal is to write down your observations, collect data, self-reflect, and develop new learning strategies for yourself. And during this process, teachers don't go away. Teachers play a very important role in that they become coaches. I would say that being a coach has three main functions. The first function is to motivate the student. Second function is to identify witnesses in the learning journal. And the third and most important function is to constantly suggest new learning strategies.
We know that the more comfortable we feel around someone, the less effort we will make about how we appear and conversely, the more anxious we are about the judgment of others, the more our reflection has the power to horrify us. The issue is never that of our appearance. It is about our sense of our vulnerability to humiliation. When we meet people who are perpetually sick with worry that they are not attractive enough, we should not rush in with physical compliments. This is only to foster and unwittingly reward an aggravating criterion of judgment. We should learn to spot the wound in their early relationships that have made it so hard for them to trust that they could matter to others in their basic state, and that therefore perpetually evokes in them an unflattering self-image. They are not ugly per se, they were, when it mattered, left painfully unloved and ignored to an extent that they are liable never to have recognized or mourned adequately. Their arrival in the world did not delight a few people as it should have done, and therefore need compassion, sympathy, and emotional validation far more than they will ever require the tools of outward beautification. Feeling ugly stems from a deficit of love, never of beauty. When economists study gift-giving, they're very concerned with one thing, waste. Let's say hypothetically that my grandmother buys me a sweater that I hate, and your grandmother buys you a sweater that you hate. Sorry, grandmothers. Before long, we're talking about billions of dollars in waste in the economy. Economists call it deadweight loss, and they estimate that up to 30% of the value of all gifts is wasted. That means the company's wasted time making the gift. It means the giver's wasted time giving it out, and it means the recipient's wasted time returning it. There's a way to fix this. There is a very specific gift that is always worth the exact same to both the giver and the receiver. It's called cash. The good thing about cash is that the receiver can always make use of 100% of its value. The bad thing about cold, hard cash is that it's cold. It doesn't say anything except, here, take some money. So this is a conundrum.
You've got sound receptors in your ear, and they are beautiful. We're not going to talk about them at any length, but there's little flappy, these little spiky things going along in your ear and they can translate vibrational energy coming from your ear, hurting your eardrum, being translated into a vibration into the fluid in your ear into a physical motion of these little receptors, they're into an electrical motion, into an electrical signal that goes into your ear. So, all of that, all of that's pretty impressive stuff. We are not going to talk about the details of it, but I invite some of you who want to learn more about this, particularly MIT students who would find receptors quite remarkable kinds of devices. Today a university like the LSE certainly has to acknowledge that it is in competition for the best students, all of whom have choices they can exercise, and many of them have choices which run across national and continental borders. We are in competition, too, for staff. The academic job market is one of the most global there is. And in the 21st century English is the new Latin. So universities in English-speaking countries are exposed to more intensive competition than those elsewhere. We are in competition for government funding, through the assessment of research quality. We are in competition for research contracts, from public and private sector sources, and indeed we are in competition for the philanthropic pound. Many of our own donors were at more than one university, and indeed think of the LSE's requests alongside those of other charities to which they are committed. That is a competitive environment which is particularly visible to Vice-Chancellor. The pace, the pace of which that the human minds have evolved over the last half million years and more recently the last 200,000 years has been so frighteningly rapid that the evolution of cognitive function and perception in different ways can only happen to the actions of a small number of genes if one needed to adapt dozens of genes changes and concert in order to acquire the penetrating minds that we now have, which our ancestors 500,000 years ago didn't have, the evolution could not have taken, could not have occurred so quickly. And for that reason alone, one begins to suspect that the genetic differences between people who lived 500,000 years ago sever that cognitive functions than ours are not so large. Therefore, a rather small number of genes may be responsible for comforting us that powerful minds which we now, which the most of us now possessed. There are two main categories of memory. Implicit memory, which is also called procedural memory, cannot be consciously recalled. It is an experimental or functional form of memory, informed by cultural and social background. With implicit memory, behaviors are automatic. We recall implicit memories naturally, so we are not aware when we are using them. Examples of implicit memory include using languages naturally, driving automatically, reading and writing. When people try to consciously describe how to drive, they may misrepresent how they actually drive. What we often describe as bad memory is explicit memory. Explicit memory is also known as episodic memory, which is totally different from implicit memory. It's more about time and space and is often related to personal life experiences. Some examples of explicit memory include remembering birthdays from many years ago, or answering multiple choice questions in a test.
One of the most amazing things that's happened even in my lifetime is the prediction of cosmology. When I started out 40 odd years ago, we thought we knew that the universe began a big bang, some people doubted even then. We thought the universe was about 10 or 20 billion years old. But now for really very sound scientific reasons we can say that the universe did started in a big bang and it's 13.8 billion years old. So it's not 14, it's not 13 because a decimal point in there and that's a stunning achievement to know that. And we also know that the laws of physical that apply to tiny particles inside atoms also explains what happened in the Big Bang, you can't have one without the other. A very neat example of this is that when you apply nuclear physics, that kind of physics to understand how stars work, you find out that the oldest star in the universe is about 13 billion years old. So their universe is just a little bit older than the stars. Fantastic, if we done it and counted in the other way around and said that the stars were older than the universe, we would say science were in deep trouble. But it's not, everything fits together and we know how the universe began, we got to know how the way it is. The future that it, LL suspects we don't know quite well what's going, but we got some ideas, which are as good as those ideas we had 40 years ago about how Big Bang happened. Well, it's like, why is Australian housing is so expensive? Essentially, it's showing of how well the Australian economy has been doing over the last 15 years. We have had 15 years more or less of an uninterrupted economic growth during which average earning has been raised by close to 90%. While over the course of that period, the standard variable mortgage rate has roughly halved, that meant that the amount which a typical home buying household can afford to borrow under rules which aren't strictly applied as they used to be had more than doubled, over the same period, rising immigration in falling average household size has meant that the number of households looking for accommodation has risen by about one and a half million, that's around 200,000 more than the number of dwellings has increased by, so you have had a substantial increase in the purchasing power of households, no net increase in the supply of housing enhance all that addition purchasing power has gone into pushing up the price of housing. Mars is fourth planet from the Sun and the second smallest planet in the solar system after Mercury, named after the Roman god of the war, it is often referred to as a red planet because the iron oxide prevalent on its surface gives it a reddish appearance. Mars is a terrestrial planet with a thin atmosphere, having surface features reminiscence both of the impact crater of the Moon, and the volcanoes, valleys, deserts, and polar ice caps of the Earth. The rotational period and the season cycles of the Mars are likewise similar of those of Earth, as it was the tilt that produced the seasons. Mars is the site of the Olympus Mons, the largest volcano and the second largest known mountain in the solar system, and the Val Marineris, one of the largest canyon in the solar system. Until the first successful Mars flyby in 1965 by Mariner 4, many speculated about the presence of the liquid water on the planet's surface, this was based on observed periodic variation. In the light and the dark patches, particularly in the polar latitude, which appeared to be seas and continents, geological evidence gathered by the unmanned mission suggested that Mars once have large scale of water coverage on the surface on some earlier stages existence.
English, as you have already read, is not a pure language. I don't think there really are any pure languages in the world. But English is definitely not a pure language. English, in fact, has borrowed from over 350 languages in its history. So it's a variety of many languages, some people say it's like a dog, a mongol dog, a dog that has been made up of many different dogs. The English language is like that, by looking at the history of the English language we learn about the history of the English people. The two things are closely connected, so, in fact, today we are not only learning about language but we are learning about history. The fact that English has borrowed words from over 350 languages has been viewed differently throughout history, so for example in Shakespeare's time people were very angry about words which were not, they thought, original English words, words which came from other languages, they didn't like them. The time in late 1990s when management consultants wrote books with titles such as The War for Talent. There was a great deal of talk about the talent wars. And I think that was the bursting of the bubble with the bursting of the dot-dom bubble and a sense of the people who had been the masters of the universe just a few weeks before we were out on the streets looking for jobs. I think this created a reaction, it gave me ideas that there was a war for talent. In fact, all of things we saw in the late 1990s are reasserting themselves now. All those shortages are reasserting themselves and the real reason the auditing was really the bursting of the bubble, not the shortages of talent. There are very profound structural forces which are creating these talent shortages, one is the fact that the nature of the economy is changing, it's putting more and more premium. Upon intellectual skills analytical skills, creative skills which are in short supply. So there is a demand increase, but there is also a decrease in supply. Because we are seeing now the aging of the baby boom, the shirking of populations in Europe and Japan and not very long in China as well and the sort of stabilization of the population of the United States so we see a time when there is a greater demand for intellectual skills and slowing down in the supply of people who possess those skills and also a mismatch between the sort of things that people are learning at school and university and the sort of things the economy is placing a premium on particularly with the shortage of trained people in the sciences and engineering. So for all sort of reasons, there's a premium on talent. For thousands of years, philosophers and astronomers and thinkers of all sorts have imagined that the universe, the space around us was rather like this floor in front of us. It was fixed and unchangeable and things happen on it, just as people walk around. So the stars, the comets, and the planets, and the other heavenly bodies moved around and traced down their paths on this completely unchanging stage of space. In the 20th century, as the result of Einstein's work, that view of the universe was completely transformed. We began to understand that there was no absolutely fixed stage of space at all celestial notions were played out. But in some sense on the larger scale in the universe, the space itself was in this state of a continuous dynamic change. That was a prediction made by Einstein. But it wasn't Einstein Harold the owner of making the discovery that our universe was really like that.